Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Nicholas. I'm a kernel engineer at, at uh, AWS, and all these work I'm presenting, but uh, all all these were discussing I've been doing with my colleague Anel. Um, we already talked about the, our approach to doing uh, VSM um, with KVM on the KVM Forum 2023, and I sent a first RFC uh, a couple of days ago. And the aim of this session is to maybe narrow down the abstractions uh, to use to implement VSM. So uh, let me set the stage. I'll talk one minute or two, and then we can discuss. Um, we have two uh, approaches that have been that have surfaced. The first one was um, representing each uh, VTL uh, CPU might have as a separate vCPU. Um, and then for the things that are uh, m among others, memory protections that are for the whole VM, uh, we add VTL awareness to that. Um, this is this introduces VTL awareness in the kernel. Uh, it adds some extra churn in the memory slot handling and, and memory management aspects of KVM. Uh, but it ad also adds some flexibility because we, we have VTL awareness in the kernel, so we can optimize some stuff. Um, user space kernel responsibilities are not clear, and and yeah. Sean proposed uh, a couple of days ago that we implement a full struct KVM per VTL, which would contain also uh, well, which contain the VTL vCPUs as well as all the state that is uh, shared by by the whole um, VM. This has very nice things, uh, among others, that all the memory management aspect of 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 the VTLs comes for free. We don't have to introduce any VTL awareness. Even it's even nicer than that uh, because there's no VTL awareness in the kernel. We might discuss whether that is good or not. Uh, from some perspectives, it is. Um, the responsibility split is super clear, and and yeah. Um, it introduces a lot of complexity on in user space because now we have two struct KVMs for a single uh, actual VM, um, and yeah, I, I haven't. I did I did some research there, and, and the QMU aspects of that are going to be very complex. So this brings some feedback uh, and and some questions. I'm I'm posing the room and would like to discuss. First of all, in in an effort to simplify memory management, are we Introducing a lot of complexity into user space. Is it worth it? I wonder. Um, not having VTL awareness in the kernel seems like a good thing, but maybe it's not the right approach. Uh, being able to optimize things in kernel with VTL awareness might eventually show up as a necessity. Uh, we have to agree on what constitutes a vCPU event for a poll interface. Uh, and can we discuss? Uh, enhancements to the memory slot, uh, IO control, uh, so that other users like Zon might use. Uh, for example, I was thinking of first class overlay support. And yeah, jokingly, uh, our memory slot address space is really that bad. <laughs> anyway, so this is VSM. Uh, and um, yep, yeah, I'm open for comments on, on my questions, if anyone has. So Nicholas, what is the main motivation to to kick all VTL awareness out of the kernel? Is it just to keep the kernel simpler, or like, are there nasty things that you actually have to do to make VTLs work? Nasty things that you actually have to do. Um, one of the subtly simple things, if you have VTL awareness, you have to have separate EPT tables for every VTL. And so then you have to either have KVM restrict how many VTLs you can create, because if you have, I guess, the TLFS allows 16 VTLs. If you have to track 16 VTLs, the number of possible page tables you can create explodes and you have to, when it starts to interact with other things that may or may not be in play for VSM, but are in play for KVM's ABI, then you have to worry about how the size of your counters to be able to track how many different page tables are possibly referencing a given page and things like that. So there's nastiness there. Um, the memory attributes won't work because those need to be per VTL, which is currently per KVM. So we would take on complexity in KVM to allow per VTL memory <coughs> attributes. And that's where you start adding everything up and you want the APIC isolation uh, per VTL. Then you are adding VTL awareness to that and you just get to a point and same thing with memslots. So you end up, you get to a point where 
you have 90% of your stuff is VTL aware per KVM. And it's like, okay, you're just eating memory overhead from a KVM perspective for that extra 10%. And you're complicating user space. So unless they're going to be uh, coming up with a new kernel, smaller kernel that's going to run in the higher VTL level, what are we trying to solve here? If you're going to trust this kernel that's running there, which is the same kernel that's going to be running in a lower VTL level. Uh, see, in the case of Hyper-V, we got a different kernel that runs in the higher VTL on the Windows side. This, one, this is not running Windows. This, this is for Windows. Just that's right. What I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, in the case of the traditional Windows stack, when we run something else in a higher level, trust level, higher trust level, we actually have a different kernel that runs there as opposed to what's running in the main stack, right? So we do all credential guard and this other guards in a, in a very controlled small kernel, right? If I'm going to be running the same kernel in both places, some of the advantages of uh, this architecture <laughs> kind of. <laughs> This is both sides. And my second point is, given that uh, the newer hardware now, both have SMP and TDS, are going to be having a notion of uh, privilege level in hardware, right? You can actually achieve this by running, you know, in some SMP case, you could run this thing in a higher privilege level, potentially. Then it's <laughs> You should be asking these guys why they want to do this. <laughs> um, from the, uh, the, to the point of TDX and S&P, those require special hardware. They have ABI that is defined by hardware vendors. Anything we can do in software, I'm 100% supportive of doing. Um, because at some point, I mean, Intel's already deprecated TDX 1.0. At some point, they're going to dec deprecate 1.5, and then we've lost backwards compatibility, and we have a mess to deal with. At some level, right, we could really think of this as a side uh, card VM. The second VM that's running So, yeah, from a KVM perspective, and that's why I like the struct KVM approach, the, the least amount of awareness we have in KVM, the more composable KVM is to support other use cases beyond VSM. And that's why from like a KVM maintenance perspective, I'm not too concerned if we have a few hundred lines of Hyper-V specific code to allow user space to support VSM, but the rest of the changes in KVM are minimal, then I don't see why we wouldn't support it. There's not very many downsides. So why do we want that uh, v VSM in general? Because customers want to use it. <laughs> yeah, and it's becoming a standard in for the American government. So you have to have it slower. Slower. Yeah. Uh, it, so for the user space side, and maybe this is a question for Paulo. How? How complex is it if we push most of this out to user space? I don't know because I've never written the code. <laughs> I know what I know is, is that uh, at least QEMU doesn't really care that there is one uh, or two VMFDs. It has, only has one because there was never a need for two. But for example, there was uh, a case in the past where we had we wanted to have a second VMFD for. Uh, uh, SCV live migration helpers when they were a thing. Uh, I mean, it, it's a bit uh, weird that you have to start two threads instead of one if you have two VTLs. But it's not really a blocker. Again, then it's also a bit a new thing that you have to pull uh, in order to know when you become runnable and kick out uh, of the run loop the lower VTL. There is some. Um, some uh, synchronization involved, some uh, some handoffs involved of the CPU state. Nothing is a particular blocker, uh, except possibly performance. Like how many times does Windows at boot uh, jump into VTL one? Because like I'm, you are going to look at uh, microseconds, uh, 
like just getting out of uh, of KVM into QMO is like 3,000, 4,000 uh, clock cycles with all the mitigations disabled. So then you have to do the IOCTLs to get and set uh, the re CPU registers and so on because they are uh, copied uh, on the hyper calls from uh, uh, from BTL0 to BTL1. You have uh, probably some kind of putex wake uh, and wake up the other CPU. Like, yeah. there is a overhead. Uh, that also depends on whether you can have uh, one thread for running the VTLs, whatever they are, and one, tell, one thread for waking up all the VTLs. Like one thread can, can handle all the interrupts and uh, you can uh, run uh, the, the vCPU only in, in one thread that picks the right file descriptor. Uh, I'm making it, it up now, so I'm not sure. But... That would break a lot of core QMU, uh, the run loop. It have to be worked out a lot, but it could be done. And yeah. especially the... the it's trick. an implementation question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, during boot, it happens a lot, thousands of VTL changes. Uh, during runtime, not so much. Um, what, uh, I forget, what is preserved across the VTL change in terms of CPU state? Like, are GPRs preserved? I have a list here. Let me see. There you have it. Um, <laughs> okay, so FPU state GPRs are the two. We need a key and get an XR to do all that stuff. KDM get a sex, I just want to understand this a bit, the this difference a bit better. So basically, if you do two different struct KVMs, it means there's no possible way to optimize the transition, the switches between VTLs. And you have to, every time you switch, you have to go and read all of those registers out from the one and write them into the other one. And there's no way to actually share state. Is that the main difference? There's not no way to do it. There's no way to do it currently in KVM. But there's no way to do it currently in KVM anyways, because you would still have to, the difference would be um, if you have VTL awareness in KVM, KVM would be hard coded to transfer that state as part of the VTL transition and KVM would be affecting the VTL transition uh, versus if you have separate struct KVMs, we would need uh, UAPI of some form to allow a fast transfer of state. Um, and would that be a possibility? For sure, I think if we went that route, um, if, if we prove that user space is too slow, it's a fairly low bar. Um, I mean, if we anything that allows the allure for me of primitives that KVM provides, as opposed to a bunch of VTL awareness, is that when some new use case comes along that wants to do something clever. I don't know if VM introspection might have had some touch points in here where they're doing crazy things with your trusted VM and your not trusted VM. Would we have gotten close to that? And could we enable them in some same way as opposed to you know their 104 patch series that they post every other year? Okay. Uh, I have more questions myself, but maybe someone, no? Okay. So with regards to polling, uh, go. I was just thinking about the copying regs. I mean, the current proposal, the current prototype you've got, it still does use user space for copying the, reg the registers, right? You pull, because you have a separate KVM vCPU, not a v separate KVM, but a separate vCPU for each VTL, yes. and you still manually pull the registers all the way up to user space and put them yeah. back into the other vCPU. Synchronize all the state upwards and, we, and then downwards. We could talk about a, a model where you you know you have an IOPSL which takes the other vCPU file descriptor and oh, copy it. That was that was a bad throw. <laughs> All right. Um, super simple. Like I, I, at first, for, for this disclaimer, I think that this premature optimization. We shouldn't be even talking about this because the current implementation we have is doing everything to the normal arc builds. And again, on the other side, everything to the normal arc builds, and it still is blazingly fast. So I don't think we even have to worry about any of this. 
but if we wanted to worry about it, and I think it's a really nice thought exercise, um, <clears throat> I think we should. I think we should implement one regs on XCD6. Implement a get many reg ioctal that allows you to get, that that gives you a list of of one reg uh, descriptors, and that way you just basically serialize a dynamic list of registers on one side, deserialize on the other side. And then we also solve all of the, oh, QMU needs to call the syscall 500 times just in order to synchronize state from KVM to user space problem throughout the whole ecosystem of KVM. See, done. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. I actually have a patch set, a, pa a, couple, a branch somewhere, a private branch somewhere where I implemented many rec. And the only reason I never sent it was because I never had performance issues with one rec. So I, I was measuring, I was, I, I was trying to accelerate our own hypervisor a bit, and, and it just didn't accelerate. So we have 10 minutes for this, and it's probably the more complicated part, so how do we I was going to say, I think the long range people wound up building that as well in their first RFC for um, uh, the architectural support too. But um, I was going to say, um, so are you still facing an issue with like needing a better like granularity for like um, controlling the guest physical address space? like? I think that there's a very clear answer for handling the two struct KVMs, but like there seems to be a, a common use case for giving user space <laughs> sub mem slot control over like more granular control over what the guest sees between the uh, the integrity stuff that we heard earlier and then this as well. That we largely have solutions for that are per KVM, which is why I just want to say, go use struct KVM, because uh, we have per page memory attributes, which we have line of sight to do and read, write, execute permissions on. I mean, we have any number of bits per page. It's just a matter of how performance and memory heavy we want to make it. And then we also have, if you have per KVM, you have per mem slots, and you can do whatever the hell you want with sure. overlay pages. So, like, giving user space the ability to that as well, right? Yes, that's there. Okay. All right. Because it doesn't solve it for the Zen guest use case. Zen guests often will want to just overlay one page somewhere, which currently involves taking away the larger mem slot and then putting away, putting back the bits both sides and the pages being over. It's but it's also really awful and buggy. We've literally spent quite a long time trying to make it work, and it's complicated and awful to pause all the VCPUs and interrupt delivery because we can't just overlay a page on the mem slots, and so. The overlays would be one way of solving it for VSM. It would be a very nice way of solving it for Zengas as well. A lot of that complication would be in the kernel anyway, because uh, you would have to like not pause the, the VCPUs, but uh, you you would have to ensure that the EPT, yeah, like you remove one EPT, you put it back. Uh, it's mm? yeah. <laughs> Like, I think it, it's not like nobody likes mem slots, uh, fair enough. But if you, if you really think that, that it is a problem, just add like mem slots uh, with, with different priorities. But uh, it, it's not a, a huge deal to, 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 have, uh, to have it in user space. Like, it's, it's not a fast path, like Alex was saying. The, the memory attributes work for this case. They work for the hypervisor kernel integrity as well. I, yeah, okay. I don't know how bad it would be to have multiple priority man slots, but. No, 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 it's priority, but yeah, multiple man slots. Certainly, one of those switch. So that's the priority. That's the priority, yeah. Right, yeah. So, but, but, yeah. but, but I think. Can we, can we, we just don't have much time Use so a minute or two to, to discuss the polling yeah. aspect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so essentially, what, what should we consider an event source for waking up a poll, uh, some, some thread that's waiting on poll on a vCPU? The way I modeled it myself was anytime a vCPU is kicked, uh, uh, the, the polling thread gets wake, woken up. And I was talking with the Xone people. They, they proposed uh, keeping, uh, moving a, a vCPU that's waiting in user space into halter state and then monitor the halter state, uh, MP state. And when, whenever we need to access, um, sorry, whenever we need to inject an interrupt, MP state will change into runnable and then we wake up and going. Yeah. 
I would stay away from MP state because you also have guest state that's stored in MP state and it's going to matter for other use cases. And we're going to complicate that a little bit. The guest goes into halt, MP state has to be halt because there are stupid guests that rely on being halted. And like we've seen cases where the guest will unmap its code that it's executing from and it relies on staying in halt. So if you have a spurious wake up, it'll blow up the guest. So that I would just stay away from. Um, but like letting user space communicate its intentions with the vcpu which is what you're talking about with mp state is valuable for other things uh, live migration blackout as an added defense mechanism when user space is stopping running vcpus at that point you should say i don't intend to run this anymore if you ever try to dirty memory from this vcpu or emulate something for this vcpu like die or kick out or something so i think a generic there's a there's more use cases than just this for user space communicating a vCPU is paused or wants to pull or something like that. Just stay away from MP state. Okay, fair enough. Uh, as also, there was a previous talk about a multi KVM, right? Like, it looks like this, uh, you know, VSM is, seems to be another. Uh, you know, kernel could be another hypervisor. I mean, wondering this if these two topics can be aligned together. I mean, so it does not necessarily have to be two structured KVM. The other side, the other, you know, VM for that it might be drastically simpler. I mean, that that might it, the only thing that except is that it has to be a common resource, you know, code. Yeah, it would be more complex because when you have two separate KVM modules, they don't have awareness of each other and they don't know the internals. And so it's harder to make them talk where if it's a single KVM module, KVM knows that if it gets a pointer and it can verify that it's the right type of file descriptor point at the right type of struct KVM, then it knows that the internal layout and it can directly poke into things. You can send ifies across VMs, you can say, I want to switch, like I can imagine something where we got to, if we need to enlighten KVM to allow quick switches between VTLs, you have a hard binding between VMs and you have to have the exact same number of vCPUs and you have exact ways to go switch to that vCPU in this different VM. If you have separate modules, you have separate text, separate data, separate layouts, becomes much more harder because to do that transition, you have to have well-defined ABI because you want to be able to have those be different and then you have to have common touch points so your complexity goes pretty high. I think we're, uh, Paul is about to hit me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah.